in the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. But how different is the world God created from the world we live in today? I'm Pastor Jason Barnett, and this is the Dirt Pastorman Podcast. Evening came and then morning the fourth day. 
Then God said, let the waters swarm with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the large sea creatures, and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water, according to their kindness. He also created every winged creature according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters and seas, and let the birds multiply in the earth. Evening came, and then morning, the fifth day. Then God said that the earth produced living creatures according to their kinds. Livestock, creatures that crawl in the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God, and he created a male and female. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, Look, I have given you every sea-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth, and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you. For all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, and for every creature that crawls on the earth. Everything having the breath of life in it. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made. It was very good indeed. Evening came in the morning. The sixth day. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So normally what I would do is I, I, I preach using a style that's called expositional preaching, which is I take ver I go through it as much as I can, verse by verse, and I kind of expand it for you, right? And then I, at the end I try to give you a point <coughs> what the text is trying to say. But because this passage is so long, I'm not going to do that today. I am not going to go verse by verse through that entire passage I just read. And all God's people said, Amen. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> But there are some phrases I want to point out to you. And, and they're important because they, they connect and help us understand why God says what he does in verse 31. In verse 31, God says, at the very end of creation, he, he, does, he says, it is very good. He doesn't just say it's good. It is good. He says, it is very good. But there's, again, there's some phrases that we will find in the text that will, that will help us kind of illuminate why that's so important. And understand what that means. So in verses 5, 8, and 10, you'll notice that it starts out by saying, God called. Right? God called the, the light day, the, the darkest night. God called, right? The sky, he called it the seas. And then he would, and that's when he called it something, he was naming it. He formed it himself, and then he gave it a name. That's an important detail. When you name something, you are establishing your authority over the object that you were naming. Think about when, when, when those of us that have kids, when your kids were born, you're in the hospital, right? And the, and the doctor's asking, well, what's the kid's name? And guess who fix the name? You as a parent do. Why? You are establishing your parental authority over the child that God has given you. So as God is creating everything, he, he, he calls it into existence, then he names it, pretty much telling us that I am sovereign Lord over everything. Now you'll notice if you continue on in Genesis 2, when it comes to the creatures of the earth, remember, uh, God's going to have all the creatures of the earth uh, parade past Adam. And what's Adam going to do as they parade past him? He's going to name them. And that's because that's, that is Adam fulfilling the purpose for which humanity was created. 
Humanity was created to do what? To rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the creatures of this earth. Man was created to be God's steward over creation. In order to fulfill that purpose, God gave Adam the right and responsibility to name all the animals. So Adam would know that I have authority over this. So right here, right here in the opening of the Bible, we're, we are told that man, mankind, as we as humans, we are not simply created as another creature. We're not part of the animal kingdom. We are a step above it because we're made in the image of God and we have God-given authority to rule over the rest of it. So every time in this passage, we read where it says God has called, that's God establishing his sovereignty over creation. Now, when you look at this passage, too, there are going to be at least five times, that's if I counted right, but I did go to Martinsville High School in Martinsville, Indiana, so counting isn't my strong suit. <laughs> but if you're going to stop and count at least five times in this passage, passage, after God creates something, it says, and, and, and it was so. That's, that's telling us that when God spoke, when God named this, it happened. It formed, it was made, it was there. In one second, it wasn't existing. God spoke, named it, and there it was existing. This is telling us God created it. It wasn't by some random chance. It was the power of God commanding whatever it was to come into existence. And while that detail might go overlooked by us, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, though. If you go through the list of what God has created in Genesis 1, you'll realize that everything that is listed there at one time or another in the history of the world, mankind has worshipped. You worship nature. You worship mountains. And God is telling us, no, 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 no. I was there at the beginning when I said, come in, come over here, form. And it was so at my word. I knew it. Don't worship this lesser thing. Hey, even in our day to day, right? People look at the sun, the moon, the stars, and they don't necessarily worship them like they did in ancient times. But we have, definitely people will look to those and think, you know what? I can look to the stars and find my destiny in life, right? They check the newspaper to find their sign that correlates to the stars, right? And they try and say, hey, this, this is going to tell me how my life is going to go. God's saying, no, 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 the stars don't tell you a thing. Except for that I made them. So that I was there before they were, and I said, let there be light. And there those, those celestial beings formed. And it was so at my command. I created them, and I'm the one that, that, that created you. Don't worship me. And let's face it, throughout human history, there have been humans that have stepped up and essentially said, well, you know what, I, I have conquered the world, so therefore I have earned the right to be worshipped. Caesar was that way. Alexander the Great, the pharaohs. God's saying, no, no, no. I was there when the first man was born. I, he, the mankind only exists because I took dirt, put it together, and breathed my life into it. Make no mistake, there is only one true and living God. And he is sovereign Lord over all of it. And he reminds us that that then is where it says, and it was so. This stuff only exists. This stuff is only here because I said it. <clears throat> then, as you continue reading through this section, at the end of each day, except for the second day, and I don't know why it doesn't say that for the second day. None of the smart people that I read their books about this section knew why it didn't say it for the second day. But after any each day, God said, and it was good. Except for the second day. But we won't worry about that because I don't know what to do. <laughs> Just be honest. I don't know what to make of that. 
that God has to be created each and every day, except for the second day, he says, and it was good. Meaning that, that when God formed it, when God created it, it was perfect. It was beautiful. It, it came out exactly the way God built it and designed it to be. It functioned the way God called it to, to be. So when God looked at it after he created creation every day, he looked at his creation, he judged and said, and this is good. In Psalms, David, he's going to reflect on this. And he's going to be looking at God's creation. It's going to lead him to a powerful observation. He writes this. He says, When I observed your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him? A son of man that you look after him. What David is saying, realizing in this point, he's looking at God's creation and it dawns on him that his God is the one that made all of these things. And that God cares about him. That that God's paying attention to him. And that same God pays attention to each and every one of us. The God that made everything. I know me. If I was all powerful and could do all that stuff, I wouldn't care and pay attention to me. That's not the way my God is. God cares about you. And David realized that it overwhelmed him. So everything God made in Genesis 1. God judges and says it is good. He says it's good. And when, and when God creates, you understand God's creation is a reflection of God's character. The reason why everything is good is because God made it and God is good. Amen? Mm -hmm. God is good all the time. When God does things, it's always good. And He only does good things in our lives. But when verse 31 comes along and God has completed all of these different acts of creation and labeled each and every one of the good, he takes a step back, he looks at the entirety of the picture and he says, it is very good. Another way you can say this is too, that according to the Hebrew word, which is translated very, is it is only good. What I have created is only good. There is nothing even evil or wicked about it. What I have created fulfills the purposes for which I have designed it, it is only good and functions the way I designed it to. It is exceedingly good. And Genesis tells us that is how God made all things. God made all things good. That includes this world and us as humanity. God created us and it was all very good. Of course, all it takes is a few seconds turning on the world news and you realize, man, this isn't. God created everything to be very good. Man, watch this news. It doesn't look very good, does it? In fact, a lot of things that happen in this world right now are condemned, are condemned by the same God who created the law. The very creation that he made that was very good is now doing things that go against the laws that he has and they are condemned by his words. Sin has corrupted God's very good creation. And sin is poisoning and destroying it. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, after, after being created by the sovereign God of the universe, Adam and Eve look at that God in the face and say, we're not going to do it your way, we're going to do it by our sin. And they sin. 
And because of their sin, and just 1,600 years after the formation of the world, after they are created, just 1,600 years later, God is going to send a flood to wipe out the earth. And why does God send that flood? Because sin had, had, sin had so corrupted the human race and infected creation. And when God, in Genesis 6, looks at creation, he says, it has become corrupt and filled with wickedness. The creation that God just 1,600 years earlier labeled very good because of sin became wicked, corrupt, and violent. And God looks at that very good creation and says, I'm going to have to, to wipe it from the face of the earth and start over. 1,600 years. So God sends the flood. He wipes out all life on the planet except for Noah, his family, and the creatures he gathered on the earth. So did that solve the sin problem? No, because as soon as Noah and his family gets off the ark, they sin again. So another 2,300 years is going to pass. From the, from the flood of Noah to Jesus on the cross. And Jesus is going to come, he's going to die on that cross as an atonement for sin. He's going to die for the forgiveness of all sin once and for all. <coughs> Did that change the world? When Jesus died on that cross, is the world different now than it was back in Rome? Sin is still reigning. Sin is still happening. Bad things are still occurring. You see, the story didn't end with Jesus dying and being put in the tomb. The story continued. Remember, Jesus died and then he rose again. He, got, he, he, gave, he took his last breath. He died, was buried in the tomb. His life came back into his body and he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. You know why he ascended into heaven? Because the scriptures command us, the scripture tells us that one day Jesus is going to come back again. And when he comes back again, he is coming back to him again to make creation good again. At the end of all things, when Jesus returns, he's coming back to, re to make all things new. When he's saying, I'm going to come make all things new, he is saying, I am going to restore God's creation back to very good. And meanwhile, until that day comes, sin continues to you and I. Paul writes in Romans, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way, death spread to all people because all sinned. And our sin, right now, our sin is killing God's creation. Our sin is destroying God's plan. Do you know right now there are at least 5 trillion pieces of trash floating in the oceans? 5 trillion pieces of trash floating in the oceans. God creates everything. He labels it very good. He gives it to us to steward over it. What do we do? We throw our garbage in. That's sin. How many creatures have we hunted to extinction? God created us to, to steward over those creatures, to name them and, and take care of them. What do we do? We hunt them until they're all gone and our bellies are too full and we can't fit them in anymore. That's sin. That's not bad enough. Our simple appetites don't have it just killing the planet and killing the animals. According to a study from 2016-2017, on average, 1,100 people are murdered per day around the globe. 1,100. I'm not talking about wars. I'm not talking about crazy dictators. I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one people hating one another to the point where they kill each other. And while we may not physically end lives, we certainly do our best using words. Displaying our selfishness and hatred. 
Sin is destroying all that is good. And the scripture tells us that one day it's going to reach a point where God's going to look at it and say, Enough! I've given you opportunity after opportunity to change your ways. I've given you opportunity after repent, opportunity to repent and come to me. But I cannot deal with your wickedness anymore. It has reached a point of no return. It has reached a point where not even I can speak in and say it because you will not listen. I understand it's not the rest of creation that's the problem. It's you and I as human beings and our sinfulness. That's infecting everything. Destroying God's very good creation. And when God says that, that is when he will send Jesus back. And when Jesus comes back, he will make everything new. And all that old stuff that is tainted by sin will be washed away in the power of Jesus. And the kingdom of God will descend and there will be no more tears. There will be no more stuff. There will be no more pain. Why? Because Jesus came and made all things new and restored God's creation to the very good for which God created it initially. What a day that will be, right? That could almost be a song. <laughs> Man, it would never work. <clears throat> God's word tells us that one day the kingdom of God will come and be merged with creation, and all will be very good. But when we're looking to Jesus and we're focusing on his return, we overlook something. We overlook a very important detail. There's a scene in, in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus is, is sitting there, and, and if you know what happens to Jesus, the Pharisees like to come and try and trip Jesus up and trap him in his words, right? They're trying to find a reason for resting, so they, they keep asking questions and trying to trap him. And one of the questions they ask Jesus is this, Jesus, tell us, when's, when's the kingdom of God going to come? What will it look like? That's what he said. That's the question they ask. And this is the answer Jesus gives them. He says, The kingdom of God is not, is not coming with something observable. No one will say, See, here, or there it is. For you see, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Did you catch that? Jesus is answering the question of the Pharisees of, when, 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 what will God's kingdom come? When, when will God's kingdom come? What will God come? Jesus answers, says, God's kingdom is here in your midst now. He doesn't talk about a futuristic event. He says, the kingdom is here right now. God's very good creation, God, the, 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 the restoration project that's going to come at the end of all things, God, Jesus looks at the Pharisees and says, it's here right now. Jesus was saying the kingdom of God arrived with him. When the word became flesh and made its dwelling among us, that is when the kingdom of God began. Remember Jesus, the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray, he said, your kingdom come, your will be done. God's kingdom showed up with Jesus. God's will was being done. Well, well yes, at the end of all things is when all of creation will be set to the very good. What Jesus is telling us is, Right now, through him, through the power of his resurrection, if we surrender to him, we don't have to wait to the all end of all things to be made very good. But the power of Jesus can make us very good now. But he's saying again, you don't have to wait to the end. He will make you good right now. Me. Broken, messed up me. Jesus can restore me. Now! It's the power, the power of Jesus. It's the power of the God that is good and only does good things. And that power can come and live in my heart and transform me from the inside out. And so I become an advanced position of his kingdom now. Not some future off of it. Now! I become a beacon of his kingdom of hope now. Not some day later. Now! Paul writes about this. He, said, he says this in the church at Ephesus. He says, As the truth is in Jesus, take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, 
to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. What Paul is writing, he says, God is going to restore you to the very good way God created everything in the beginning. He's doing a factory reset on your life. He goes on to say, and this is the church of, uh, to the Colossians. He says, put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. Whoa. Because of the power of Jesus in your life, you don't have to continue living by the broken pattern that you're living. Jesus has the power to set you free and set you free indeed. What Jesus is saying is confess Jesus the Lord, repent of your sins, and believe this good news. And through Christ, the Lord of creation, we renew the very, the very good creation in your heart and life. No matter what you've done, no matter the situation you find yourself in, if you confess Jesus as Lord and you put your faith in Him, He will make something good come out of this brokenness. How do we know? Because He's the God that took nothing and He created everything. And if our God can do that, there is nothing that He cannot do in your life. There is no situation that He can't redeem. There's no obstacle that he can't help you find a way to overcome. The goodness that you are searching for, the goodness that you're hoping will come, that will be the outcome, the only place you will find it is through the name of Jesus. He is where you find it. Paul writes in Corinthians, he says, I plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That word reconcile, that means reunited. He's saying be reunited to God. Sin has separated you from Him. Sin has taken you, the once very good creation, and corrupted you. And God is sitting, Paul is pleading with the Corinthians, He's just as Jesus is pleading with you and I. Be reconciled to God because through me there is the path of life. There is a path of everything that is good. It's a goodness that this world cannot take away from you. It's a goodness that cannot be hindered. It's a goodness that can't be stopped. Because there is no one greater than our God. There is no power that can overcome Him. Not even your own work mind. If you're willing to give your life. Dear God, as we close this night here this morning, I pray that in this moment we would cast aside all the sin that would entangle us. All the things that are destroying us in our hearts and our minds. All the things that are hindering us from embracing you fully and realizing the goodness that is available to us. God, because you want to give us the power of your resurrection. You want to establish your kingdom, not a some far off day, but you want to establish it here and now, and you want to start with my life, and the lives of people in this room. But God, may we not be afraid, may we not cower in fear, because we realize that we sin against you, but instead, Lord, would your love draw us out? Would your perfect love cast out all the fears that we have, all the doubts? And would you give us the faith to believe? for this week's 30 second takeaway. Perhaps you listened to today's sermon and you're still doubting and questioning the restorative power of God. If that's you, I would encourage you to spend some time this week reading through the gospels and the stories of Jesus and see how many times he restored the sight to the blind, restored speech to the de- to, or to the mute and hearing to the deaf. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, excels at restoring. So just imagine what he can do in your life if you would let him into your heart. Until next time.
listening to this episode of the Dirt Pass Sermon Podcast. It was recorded live at the Greensburg Church of Nazarene, located at 31 Bluebird Lane in Greensburg, Kentucky. Our theme song is called The Dirt Path, performed by Jeremy Edwards. If you would like to share a word of testimony with us or what God's been doing in your life, you can reach us at P.O. Box 215, Greensburg, Kentucky, zip code 42743. Or you can also find us at www.gbergnaz.com on the Greensburg Church and Nazarene Facebook page or the Dirt Path Facebook page.